mid-1930s, most people believed that war was imminent. Nearly all attempts to avoid confrontation or claim neutrality would be fruitless. Many knew that any assurances about Hitler's peaceful intentions were worthless. Hitler clearly had military ambitions. Europe was preparing for war. With the headlines came fear. With fear came the inevitable response. For Sweden, the defense of its neutrality required mobilizing the entire population. Recruiting centers sprang up across the country. All young men were asked to defend the nation against a potential enemy. Everyone thought about the horrible consequences of an invasion. At the train stations, family and friends departed, filled with hope and fear. A final hug. Ahead, long months of training and waiting. In Sweden, preparing for war was seen as arming for peace. Sweden's defenses could not withstand a German invasion. Sweden's air force was a collection of light aircraft, only capable of token resistance against the German Luftwaffe. Their reconnaissance aircraft were slow, lumbering targets. Although Swedish aircraft had been effective in World War I, they were now outdated. Sweden's prime minister recognized the urgency of the problem, but he felt that his nation should produce its own weapons. Importing weapons would be faster, but it made Sweden too dependent on other countries. The Swedish parliament agreed and passed a resolution expressing the desire to quickly establish an advanced aircraft industry. The result was the creation of Saab in May of 1937. Saab, uh, that is four letters, S-A-A-B, and it stands for, in Swedish, it's pronounced Svenska Aeroplan Aktiebolaget, and translated into English, it is Swedish Airplane, and Aktie is the same as stock, uh, we have it in the stock market, and Bolag is corporation. So it's really Swedish Airplane Incorporated. Once funding for Saab was secured, the build-up began in earnest. Building aircraft is a time-consuming and difficult task. It requires complex engineering, planning, and building technologies governed by integrated systems and controls. In order to acquire the needed technology and experience, Saab shrewdly began licensed production of foreign aircraft. For the Swedish Air Force, they began to build a version of the German Junkers Ju-86 bomber in the summer of 1938. The Junkers 86 began life in 1934 as a commercial airliner, but within a year, a military version was also being made available for export. In Germany, the Junkers 86 formed the original bomber squadrons of the rearming Luftwaffe. It was considered to be obsolete by the time Saab obtained their license. The Germans had moved on to other aircraft and relegated the 86 to reconnaissance duties. But Saab did not put all of their efforts into one plane. They licensed and built several other aircraft, including Grumman fighters for the Finnish Air Force. Using what they learned from the various planes, they began to determine what kind of aircraft they wanted. Soon the Saab engineers, assisted by American aircraft technicians, began to design, build, and test an all-Swedish airplane. The new plane was known as the Saab 17. It was a single-engine, two-seater that could either be configured as a dive bomber, a vertical bomber, or a reconnaissance aircraft, depending on the engine. It was the first Swedish plane to be built completely out of metal. The 
Saab 17 made its first flight in May of 1940. 325 would be built in the next four years. It remained in service into the 1950s. Being a very small country and, and few resources, we had to figure out what is the best type of airplane for our conditions. Engineering in Sweden has a certain background which is uh, at least it was known for very, very high quality and making very good analysis early upstream. So the aircraft were fairly small and uh, you created uh, early new technology which was brought into the aircraft. The next project was introduced in 1942. The Saab 18 became one of the world's fastest twin-engine bombers, a major achievement for a young company. By 1945, the engineers were ready to reveal a third plane, the Saab 21A. This was a highly advanced fighter with twin tail booms, ejection seat, and a pusher propeller. This design eventually became Sweden's first jet. But its first flight was a bit shaky. The landing gear brakes did not release fully during the takeoff, and the plane clipped the fence at the end of the runway. Fortunately, the pilot completed the takeoff, but he collapsed the main gear upon landing. Saab had come a long way in a short time, but management was worried about how the company would land after the war. At the end of the war, Saab realized the market for military aircraft would shrink, and commercial aircraft production would not provide enough jobs. One possible solution, build cars. When the World War II ended and the demand went down, uh, it was necessary to look for some other product for that area, for that specific area. And the plant was there, and the uh, natural thing was really to look for maybe just cars, because uh, that's another way of transportation. Voyages will conditional now returns to Voyages. After World War II, automobiles were once again a common sight all over Sweden. Rural towns were growing, and Sweden was expanding its road system. Manufacturers were pressured to build new cars. Saab managers began to believe that car production could be profitable, but they wondered what kind of car to build. set with a geography and climate that was, to say the least, challenging. Heavy snow in the north with dense fog and rain in the south made driving an adventure. While small cars were more economical, many local motorists doubted they could withstand Sweden's rough road conditions. These concerns had helped American car makers in Sweden. During the 30s and 40s, ANA, an independent auto assembler, was established for the purpose of assembling Chrysler automobiles from imported components. Taking advantage of cheaper labor and freight costs, Plymouth exported car kits to Sweden for assembly and sale. The 5,000 parts needed for each car were assembled by hand. Post-war Europe was impoverished. There was a high demand for steel to rebuild the continent. Any project that required large amounts of steel was subject to delays and shortages. The importing of kit cars might be a perfect interim solution for production in a ravaged economy. This process did not require the tooling, foundries, or large stocks of raw materials associated with car making. But Saab management felt they could find the resources and become a viable automobile manufacturer, not a kit car builder. In 1944, Saab started gathering a team to explore building its first car. The effort would be headed by an engineer, Gunnar Jungström, and a designer, Sikton Sossen. During World War 
II, a German V-1 rocket crashed in Sweden after an erratic test flight over the Baltic Sea. Sawson produced detailed drawings of the recovered rocket's engines. His sketches of the V-1 parts were flown to England for analysis by British ballistic experts. His ability to combine the understanding of engineering with the talents of an artist was a rare gift. It helped Sawson easily translate concepts into reality at a reasonable cost. As a design engineer, he was a genius. He and Gunnar Jungstrom, a wing designer, were chosen to create Saab's first automobile. Jungstrom was well educated and he came from a family of inventors and engineers. He had worked on several automotive component designs prior to the war. Many consider him to be the father of the Saab automobiles. Gunnar Jungstrom is definitely the father of Saab cars and he was from the very beginning, well he's coming from uh, the Jungstrom family which is a very well, well known engineering family. Uh, engineer, they engineered turbines, uh, ships and, and, and then now airplanes and then cars. The aerodynamic designs made it obvious that the first car came from an aircraft manufacturer. As Sawson's pen yielded the final design, Gunnar Jungstrom began to decide on its components. I think when Sawson was the designer or uh, creating the exterior of the car and um, he was really the uh, visionary in terms of the visible things, while Gunnar Jungström was a visionary of the more invisible things. It took less than six months to build the prototype, even without modern production resources. The components were hammered into shape by a 70-year-old panel beater over oak dollies. Materials were scarce. The design team scoured local scrapyards for parts. The prototype was fitted with a pre-war German two-stroke engine and front-wheel drive. But the simple and inexpensive two-stroke engine would later become a millstone around Jungstrom's neck. On February 27, 1947, Saab's board of directors approved the decision to proceed. A new car was born. But the world was once again becoming a dangerous place. In 1948, Russian troops blockaded Berlin. To Saab, this meant that all civil aircraft activities had to be abandoned in favor of military requirements. The Swedish Air Force expanded to become the fourth largest in the world. Meanwhile, the automobile prototype was subjected to a punishing test program it became apparent that this airfoil on wheels was tough enough. But the scarcity of steel and the demands for new military aircraft delayed the first auto delivery to late 1950. The Saab 92 was clearly the work of an airplane designer. It resembled no other car. Like the Model T, it came in only one color. Saab's choice was dark green. Well, we had painted all our aircraft in, in military green. So, so there were stocks of military green paint there, and that was why it came in green. Potential buyers loved this jolly frog-like car. They appreciated the rigid construction, the strong windshield pillars, and high ground clearance. Front wheel drive allowed for a spacious interior. The 25 horsepower two-stroke two-cylinder engine would eventually be a liability. Like all two-stroke engines, it emitted more unburned gases than four-stroke models. Eventually, the public's demand for more advanced engines would kill the two-stroke. As the Cold War grew hot in places like Korea, Saab couldn't keep pace with the public's demand for its car. Ford buyers spread rumors that Saab was putting all its efforts into making a new jet fighter, the Saab 29, nicknamed the Flying Barrel. As aircraft production intensified, some observers claimed that Saab would soon abandon car production.
Voyager now returns to Voyagers. Saab had no intention of pulling out of car making, but they had to overcome a new problem, increased foreign competition. To combat the competition, they added a trunk, a large rear window, increased the headroom, and made the seats more comfortable. The redesigned Saab, the 92B, was introduced in the fall of 1952. It was a success. To make a name for the car, the 92 hit the world rally circuit. Rally activities provided the perfect environment for engineers to test their concepts. The car's early successes showed the world that Saab was as advertised, tough and reliable. Saab's aviation efforts were also getting noticed. In 1955, the Saab 29 Flying Barrel achieved a world speed record of 1,000 kilometers, or 621 miles per hour. Sweden saw the need to increase the funding for supersonic research but this decision still allowed for new investment in car production. By late 1955, the Saab 93 was introduced. Although it sported a restyled front end, the real story was the smoother running, more powerful three-cylinder engine, which now delivered 33 horsepower it was still a two-stroke engine, and like all two-strokes, had to have a combination of gas and oil. The gas cap had a label to remind people to add oil to the mix when filling up. Two-stroke engines were really not uh, that common in that period, and uh, people that were used to uh, conventional cars, they were filling just fuel but our car had to have a combination of oil and fuel. And uh, we had to highlight this, uh, and of course, it is necessary to highlight it when you start to fill, fill the fuel. That is why it was uh, noted on the fuel filler cap, please put in oil and fuel. Saab began to discover the powers of advertising as marketing experts set their sights on America. The car's aviation heritage and competition prowess helped to get attention, but Saab didn't want to move too fast. Without an efficient American parts and service organization, buyers might have to wait weeks for repairs. Saab concentrated on small, manageable groups of affluent buyers. Surveys showed that over 90% of these buyers were satisfied with their cars. They especially liked the good fuel economy and unusual features like the ability to convert the cars for sleeping. We didn't have the motels and hotels as you have here spread out over the country. So you had, like its name, you had to have your, your house with you. Uh, so that was why it was created as, as, as a house, living house. So you could move wherever you, you liked, and you just parked the car, and you slept in it. While many mainstream Americans didn't like the two-stroke engines, Saab's rally reputation helped to create excitement and demand. In 1956, Saab entered three cars in the Great American Mountain Rally and made a clean sweep. A car that was at home jumping and sliding through the countryside or transporting a family to church wasn't for everyone, but it began to attract loyal buyers. Exports to the USA arose rapidly from nearly 300 cars in 1956 to over 6,000 in 1959. In just three years, Saab had turned America into its main export market. Many of the early model Saabs can still be found in northwestern Washington state. Two brothers alone own over 50 cars. Many proud Saab owners hope to drive their beloved cars forever. Skipshot has made a living breathing new life into Swedish iron. A collection of cars and parts is scattered around his house. 
As parts become difficult or impossible to find, restorations take longer. The years have not been kind to many of these cars. Some call this assortment of cast-off parts junk. Others see it as a treasure chest of opportunities. Depending on your point of view, anything is possible. We drove this car up yesterday. Uh, a lot of fun to drive. Uh, ran 55 miles an hour in the freeway, no problem at all. Just uh, a lot of people waved that if we waved back and smiled. Uh, when, we, uh, when we organize an event for our club, we try to organize it someplace that we can drive to. Because that's what they're made to be. Done. We don't uh, we don't trail them around and and uh, spit and polish them. They get polished, but they also get driven. Well, the the, the two strokers they, they do smoke, and that's the that's part of the mystique. And the the people that are dyed in the wool two strokers they're always they're always smelling the smoke. And uh, the the real aficionados they 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 discuss the. Uh, the nuance of the smoke and, and is it really the old high M oil or is it new spectro oil or or what what is the uh, what is the nuance of this uh, of this smoke and a lot of people think it's pollution but no it's it's really uh, it's really clouds of love is what it is on the rally circuit the sobs of the 1950s produced even more smoke and their success and victories caught the world's attention Eric Carlson proved what skill, daring, and a great little car could do. A legend among rally drivers, Carlson thrilled the racing world with his hard-charging style and competitive spirit. His rallying became famous because he took extremely high risks with a very, very small car. Um, he is uh, named as Eric Carlson on the roof. And that was, of course, because he really take very, very, took very, very big risks and turn over on the roof several, several times. But um, being that risk taker and trying to cope with it, um, he also became a winner. Even in the hands of an everyday driver, the Saab 93 was an impressive off-road machine that seemed to control the most demanding terrain. But world events could not be controlled. In the fall of 1956, the Egyptian blockade of the Suez Canal led to an oil crisis. In Sweden, the result was a ban on Sunday driving by private motorists and the introduction of gas rationing. This had an immediate effect on car sales, but Saab continued production as planned. By the late spring of 1957, the crisis was over and the oil was flowing again and Saab was gearing up to introduce a new model. A two-door estate model, or station wagon, the Saab 95 was finally offered in 1959. Its utility was obvious. Performance-minded buyers were thrilled with the new four-speed transmission. In 1960, after 10 years of car making, Saab unveiled its fourth new model to the press. Produced for 20 years, the 96 became a Saab classic, featuring 1950s body styling with 1960s technology. Voyages will continue in a moment. The International now returns to Voyages. In its first year, the 96 increased Saab Swedish sales nearly 45%. Many features were soon included, such as a remote hood release, a bigger 841cc three-cylinder engine, upgraded double system brakes, and an improved heating and ventilation system. Saab modified the instrument panel, making the controls easier to see and operate, and even the pedals were redesigned. The biggest improvement came with the increased production rate at the Trollhatten plant. Now Saab had the capacity to produce 30 to 40,000 cars a year. By January 1965, Saab had produced more than a quarter of a million automobiles, 
It took just one more year to reach 300,000. But Saab didn't rest. It made a total of 1,500 product improvements on the 96 during the first six years of its production. The three-speed transmission was soon a thing of the past. All the 96s now came with four-speed gearboxes. The new Gran Turismo model of the 96, later called the Monte Carlo 850, offered a 55-horsepower engine, independent lubrication, and a triple carburetor. It introduced fun into everyday driving. It was really just uh, an um, upgrading of performance, uh, offering um, different um, interior appearance, uh, with the bucket seats, uh, it had a wood wooden steering wheel, so it was really looking more into the sporty market. Um, and I think the flavor was really coming from England, uh, where you had a lot of sports cars. The times were good, cars were selling, production was up, the car business was booming. But internally, a struggle was underway. Gunnar Youngstrom was fighting for the introduction of a four-stroke engine. An improved paint job could not hide the fact that the two-stroke engines were trouble. Officially, they were reliable, but in fact, they had an endless succession of serious problems that the engineers were getting tired of solving. But Saab has spent a fortune on expanding the plant, and management said there was no money to develop and produce a new engine. Bolstered by surveys that showed that over 75% of the Swedish public would buy a four-stroke powered car, the engineers launched a series of tests. They were determined to either fix the two-stroke or convince management that if they switched engines, enough people would buy it to warrant the tooling costs. The engineers subjected a series of four-stroke and two-stroke engines to the most rigorous tests. This search for perfection was often pursued on the Saab test track with extreme secrecy. It was feared that if the public found out Saab was testing four-stroke engines, people would postpone their purchases and the market would disappear for the current two-stroke models. Saab engineers tested engines from Triumph, Renault, Volvo, Ford, and many others. The engineers finally decided that a Ford V4 four-stroke engine would be ideal. In Britain, the engine powered the rear-wheel drive Ford Cortina, and in Germany, the front-wheel drive Taunus. After moving the radiator forward, Saab engineers could easily slip the Ford engine into a 96. engine testing continued, the 96 became a rally machine. Saab was able to engineer an amazing 86 horsepower from the tiny two-stroke engines. But the cars were still difficult to control and drive. Engine development had reached its limit. Eric Carlson had become a company hero as he won honors as a world-class aggressive driver. Starting in 1961, Carlson won the British RAC rally three times in a row. He also triumphed at the Monte Carlo Rally in 1962 and 1963. Carlson made it look easy and fun. But the Saab 96 would be no match against the new 200 horsepower machines that Ford, Porsche, and Fiat were about to introduce. Gunnar Jungström continued to urge the board to support the development of a four-stroke engine. Ironically, competition success hindered his attempt to modernize the engine. Management reasoned it must be fine if it's winning. By 1964, Saab was the only company defending the technology. Being unconventional was now a handicap. Sales were falling. Management finally got the message. In 1967, the 96 was outfitted with the Ford V4 four-stroke engine. The two-stroke was now just an option. As the rest of the world enjoyed the euphoria of the late 60s, America was quickly becoming overtaken by Vietnam. 
This conflict would extend into the mid-70s, bringing with it a new generation of cars and a new generation of buyers. Even though Sweden escaped the turmoil of Vietnam, the Swedish Ministry of Defense ordered 175 of Saab's 37 Viggen aircraft in 1968. While defense sales were important, autos weren't ignored, especially the growing American market. But Saab would have to change to expand in that important market. The Saab Sonnet, a 1956 prototype, provided the designers with the inspiration to build a low-slung, sporty model. Principally for the American market, the Sonnet was reborn in 1967. In Swedish, Sonnet means how nice, how neat. This nice and neat car quickly became Saab's test bed for new technologies. It's now one of the most valued Saabs ever produced. That same year, Saab turned the corner and introduced its first world-class car. The era of inexpensive basic transportation was passing. Sigtensausen created a car with a long nose and a short rear deck. Enter the Saab 99. The 99 took over 400,000 engineer hours to design. Like all Saabs, the prototype was built by hand. It was a painstaking process of fitting, welding, and painting. Although the 99 was a totally different car, it was still Saabish in design. Well, the 99 was really to try to take a step up in, uh, in um, a little larger car, and more family-oriented, offering more space. Uh, it was from the very beginning a um, um, four-stroke engine. It was also a very compact car, an extremely compact car from outside, but a very large engineers that wanted to be to offer a lot uh, for least possible resources. Its crash-worthy, unitized body would soon be adopted by other manufacturers. Saab had never used a conventional frame in their cars. This aviation-inspired innovation reduced weight and added strength. Lighter cars were also more fuel-efficient and needed smaller engines for good performance. The 99's first engine was built by Triumph. Saab couldn't afford to develop a new engine on its own and had entered into a joint venture with the British company to save money. Rigorous testing helped the car's technology evolve. The body panels were assembled over a rigid safety cage. The front and rear ends were designed as energy absorbent zones to protect passengers in head-on and rear-end collisions. Safety tests showed this design and new padding would reduce passenger injuries. For the first time, drivers could keep their headlights clear with the 99's new lamp wipers. Their passengers rode in comfort with heated seats. Saab had not tried to make a modern status symbol. They just hoped that common sense design would last longer. This philosophy made the 99 a worldwide contender. Once again, rally racing beckoned Saab. But during the 70s, developments were affected by the oil crisis. Gas guzzlers were unpopular, but people wanted good performance. Saab began to experiment with turbocharging. A turbocharger gave a four-cylinder engine V8 performance and good fuel economy. So in 1978, Saab introduced the astounding Turbo 99, setting a new competitive standard and boosting sales worldwide. Turbo-powered Saabs quickly hit the rally circuit and started to win. Unfortunately, in the late 1970s, rule changes made international rally racing too expensive for Saab. Saab left competition in 1980 and turned all of its attention to new product development.
Voyages will continue in History Channel International now returns to Voyages. The 1980s brought an evolution to Saab's aircraft and automobile production. Computer-aided design, robotics, and composite materials set new world standards for excellence. Software produced hardware, and data became king. Saab was now on the leading edge of manufacturing technology. The first vehicle to be designed with this new generation of technology was the aerodynamic Saab 900. It represented a truly modern Saab. Customers wanted something new, and Saab wanted to make bigger and better equipped cars. Now in the price range of luxury models, the 900 became popular with discriminating buyers. The 900 maintained the same low drag characteristics of Gunnar Jungstrom's first creation. At the same time, American collision safety standards were increasing. Already ahead of the game, Saab took its experience with the 99 and incorporated it into the Saab 900. Building cars for an affluent and demanding market required that Saab be truly competitive. The luxury market was a trendy environment. The only way Saab could compete was to lead the way. By using independent suspension, coil springs, and four-wheel disc brakes, Saab engineers were striving to perfect the art of driving comfort and safety. The new Saab 900 was equipped with energy-absorbing bumpers, electronically heated seats, headlight cleaners, an anti-lock braking system, and a turbo engine. One thing that hadn't changed was the use of front-wheel drive. Saab's image was transforming. Once derided as producers of unexciting, quirky cars, now they were known as innovators. The turbo had done a lot for Saab's image. As the world's automotive market becomes more competitive, it is harder to increase sales. Still, it is believed that the 900 sales will keep growing. The convertible cabriolet will always be remembered as the most successful 900 ever introduced. Originally launched in 1986 for the American market, over 27,000 were sold that first year. After producing the 900 for the near luxury segment, Saab was at work on a new model. Unveiled in 1984, the new Saab 9000 offered all the safety and performance and fuel economy modern testing could provide. The public safety concerns and the energy crisis of the 70s had called for new designs and new thinking. Essentially, a new design philosophy. The 9000 answered that need. Driven to produce its safest car to date, Saab once again took extreme measures to ensure that this car would prove to be one of the finest in the world. Designing a car which was smaller on the outside than the 900, yet larger on the inside, was said to be impossible. With the use of computer modeling and the philosophy of elegant simplicity, the impossible was achieved. All in a package with a longer wheelbase, a wider track, a transversely mounted engine, and front wheel drive. This combination ensured that the engine occupied the smallest possible space, maximizing the room available for the occupants and their luggage. Externally smaller than the 900, the 9000 was the biggest car the company had ever built, and the press loved it. Saab sent out to prove that the 9000 deserved the attention by entering three ordinary production models in an endurance test. Performed under the supervision of NASCAR at the Alabama International Motor Speedway in Talladega, the long run was conducted in October of 1986. 
After 20 days of all-out driving, each car totaled 100,000 kilometers, or 62,000 miles, equal to two and a half circuits around the world, with the best average speed of 132 miles per hour. The celebration didn't last very long. Profit margins were shrinking, production costs were up, and there were strong new competitors. Saab, like many of the smaller manufacturers, recognized that surviving in the future would be a precarious balancing act. New production technology made car production so flexible that the big manufacturers would soon be able to produce low-volume cars and be profitable. But the small producers, like Saab, were under attack. So the, the natural uh, way to progress was, was, let's look and see if we can associate ourselves with some of these large guys. It was their only way that they saw they could continue to be a successful and profitable company. We early uh, uh, understood that it was necessary for Saab to have partnership with some of the big car manufacturers because the development uh, for the future is very costly you need to have huge resources and um, we understood that we couldn't move into the future by ourselves in order to stay in the automobile business Saab went shopping for a partner at the same time General Motors was trying to solve its own problems as the European market heated up GM desired access to a European luxury model their German car the Opel wasn't accepted. They wanted an established luxury brand because um, they had tried for several years to to elevate the Opel products into that into those segments in Europe and they were unsuccessful in doing that. You know, it, it, again, it's you know it's brand positioning. The Opel is is positioned as a volume car, a volume car in the European, and the, the luxury buyer just would not accept that as you know as a as a real entry into those segments. GM began to look seriously at Saab. Saab was not a luxury car per se, but it was a near luxury car, and an association with Saab could solve some of GM's other problems. In the early 1990s, the European market was really starting to grow. General Motors was very tight for capacity, and Saab had excess capacity. So it also provided them some capacity for some of the GM products. By March of 1990, Saab and General Motors were ready to announce the beginning of their joint venture. Saab lovers hoped merging the two corporate cultures would provide the resources for a continuation of Saab's unique blend of technology and performance. Investors hoped the arrangement would make Saab and GM more competitive. The response to the introduction of the revamped 900 in 1994 indicates that both camps will be pleased. In the end, the consumer has the last word. They like what they see. Sales are up, and there are plans for an updated 9000 and some other completely new models. To be successful, we have to grow. For the next couple of years, our outlook is, is in the area of 100,000 to 120,000 cars. We think by the end of this decade, you know, we have to be producing 150, and in the post-2000 period, we have to we have to be producing more than 200,000 cars a year. To do that will mean two things. Number one, a broad product line, a lot of feasibility studies, a lot of market research going on today as to what type of market should we be looking at. Uh, what type of market segments we should, we should be looking at, and then secondly, what market should we be in. The glory days probably are not over. Deeply rooted in its past, sharing ideas and technologies, always looking for new solutions, Saab's heritage is unique in the auto world. The evolution of Saab automobiles is a story of refinement. Always looking to solve problems from a different point of view, Saab risked its future on designs and technologies that few dared to attempt.
From smoking two-stroke engines to screaming turbos, Saab chose to break with tradition and fly against the wind.